Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers and listeners are advised that the following program may contain photographs, images and voices of deceased persons that may cause distress. Hello and welcome to another Mad Men podcast, a series of new podcasts where we're hoping to shed the light into some really interesting stories, some history today, and maybe find some positivity in some difficult times. My name is Jonathan Fogarty. It's an absolute privilege to join you as always. And joining me, my fellow madman, the wonderful Mr. Simon Reeve. How are you, sir? Thank you, Jonathan. Great to be here today. And I feel like I'm a kid in the classroom today. I have a lot to learn from these people today. We sure do. We've got a really wonderful and interesting group joining us today. Um, a really poignant and important conversation that we need to have in the shadow of, of Reconciliation Week. We've got a group of people who are the friends of Mile Creek, and they've been a group who've been striving to raise awareness of the Mile Creek Massacre and to try and forge a, a better view and a better relationship between the white and black history of our country and are doing a great job. So joining me uh, in no particular order, we've got Janelle Speed, uh, a member of the, the National Committee. Uh, we've got Ivan Roberts, who's co-chair of the Friends of Mile Creek. A big welcome to Peter Stewart, historian and author of the compelling book, Demons at Dusk. Uh, Kelvin Brown, just about to join us. Kelvin, hello and welcome to Down you. there somewhere. <laughs> and, and Graham Cordner, chair hey, of the... Hey, Jonathan, Senate. how are you? Good, mate. Nice. Thanks for joining. Um, so, good day, everyone. I hope you're all well. How are we all doing today? Going well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, welcome. Thanks, really important conversation and, and really timely in, in the shade of world events. Peter, we might turn to you. Can you give us a sense of the history and, uh, and the events that led us to the point we are today? The the history is um, it started basically as soon as soon uh, as soon as we landed here. Um, in 1788, um, there was conflict um, fairly early on, and um, you know there were numerous uh, massacres that were undertaken. The ones leading up to the Mile Creek massacre were particularly um, deadly from the Aborigines' point of view, first Australian point of view, in that um, the one at Waterloo Creek, which was a government-sanctioned a massacre since a guy named um, Major Winniet Nunn was sent up by the acting governor, uh, Kenneth Snodgrass, to use all means possible to suppress the Aborigines in the area. With about um, 60 men on horseback, 25 or 30 of them being uh, troopers, and uh, about another 25 of the local assigned convict stockmen, they rode around that uh, area up near... Um, everywhere all the way up to, to Moree, um, Bingra, north of Tamworth, that sort of north and um, New South Wales, Liverpool Plains area. They basically slaughtered any Aborigines they came across. At Waterloo Creek on Australia Day, 1838, there was a particularly horrific massacre where even the um, official court estimated that uh, more than 40 first Australians were killed there. Estimates go up to as many as 200 being killed there. The people that ended up at Mile Creek were um, people that were promised protection from the um, massacres. They were there for several weeks, were living peacefully till the um, evening of uh, Sunday the 10th of June, when uh, a group of 10 convict stockmen led by a squatter, a young squatter named John Fleming, rode into the Mile Creek station chased them all into one of the huts, tied them all up to a rope, and then took them out to the ridge uh, about 800 metres away and slaughtered them all, men, women and children, and that included little babies. When we first heard about Mile Creek, my dad, he'd sit and tell this with tears in his eyes. He'd tell us about the massacre. My mob was the Gummeroy people, they all travelled all over and in 1838 they came here to camp by the river. One afternoon some of the 
younger men went to work. The kids would have been playing. The old men would be sitting on this to shade and the women would be getting ready to cook dinner for them. This is what I picture in my mind is that all of a sudden these horses came up on them, men on horses came up on them and just rode into their camp, start shooting and killing our kids and our women. And the old men, they was too old to get up to run. So, Graham, do pick up on the, on the point there, uh, because the events after the massacre are quite remarkable in and of themselves. After the immediate, uh, immediately afterwards, there were some who, the young men, uh, were away cutting bark with the station uh, overseer, a man called Hobbs. And they came back and they found what had happened. There were uh, some children and some women who managed to escape. And uh, they were encouraged by the convict, the one convict there at the side who refused to join the gang. When the gang rode in, there were two convicts and one chose to join the gang and the other one refused. And that's really significant, I think, in our history, the one who refused, a guy called George Anderson. Anyway, he encouraged them to get away. They, they went away, but the gang came back and it seems, we don't know, but it seems they caught up with this group and massacred most of them as well. Tragically, it wasn't the first nor the last massacre of First Nations people in Australia, but the way it was handled, and I guess the My Old Creek one, and I'm not sure Ivan or Peter or Janelle or Kelvin, whoever wants to come in, uh, the way it was handled by the authorities was different, wasn't it, in terms of how it was handled? Tell us a little bit about the history of the repercussions uh, and the legal process that followed, if you could. The situation, we, we had an almost perfect storm there uh, in terms of getting the massacre reported, investigated, the perpetrators put on trial and then hung, in that we had a new governor, a very idealistic governor named George Gipps, who was part of the Whig reform movement in, in England, um, which was, you know, what we'd call a sort of a left wing very humanitarian sort of movement in, in England. And he'd only been in the colony a few months and he really wanted to do the right thing um, by First Nations people. And when he had the massacre reported to him and it was only reported by um, William Hobbs and, um, and a, a guy named Fred Foote, who was one of the squatters up there who reported it. So. You then had you had Gibbs at the top. You had John Plunkett, who was an amazing Attorney General, really interesting man with an incredible history. And you had um, William Hobbs, who the overseer, who was horrified at what he discovered when he came back. You know, and these people he'd been, you know, just sitting around the campfire having dinner with a few nights earlier. He went and discovered all their bodies, you know, including the, the old men and the little children and all that sort of stuff that was massacred there on the side of the hill. And um, so he was horrified. So you had, as I said, Gibbs at the top, um, Plunkett, the Attorney General. You had Foote, who was prepared to ride down to Sydney to report at the squatter. You had um, William Hobbs, and as Graham mentioned, the all important George Anderson, who was the actual convict witness who didn't take part. And his evidence was just crucial. So that's how, and, and he's the only guy in Australia's history, the only white man in Australia's history to so closely witness a massacre, not take part, and then be prepared to stand up in court and give evidence. And that's why, you know, the, the Mile Creek massacre is so important. It's just, it stands alone in our history. For, for that reason. So mm. it's really, and, and it sort of really sheds light on the truth about the way those massacres were undertaken. 
And as I say, that as I mentioned before, so many of them were government sanctioned. So now let's bring you in. Um, how were you drawn to this story? And give us a little bit of uh, background to yourself. I was drawn to this story through some work at first. Um, it was to do a, with a colleague of mine, to do some uh, work for a business feasibility study for uh, the Myall Creek Committee. After doing that work, I became very inspired by what I'd seen already that had been achieved. Um, and so I thought that I would maybe offer um, my energy and education um, and my skills to uh, assist the committee in any way I could to establish it as a national memorial for uh, massacres in Australia and to help represent um, the reconciliation process that had been undertaken by this project um, to move forward and to, to um, identify w what it was that was so special about this one, um, but also to acknowledge all the other massacres that have happened over Australia. I'm an, a Birupai Dungadi woman. Um, I lived in the Northern Tablelands for uh, most of my life, worked in various areas in health and education and um, and uh, community uh, for the last 15, 20 years. So tell us a little bit then, but it's 20 years since you formed the group. Who, who wants to pick that up? Tell us about the early stages of that and, and maybe the challenges or how, how did you get to the start line to be able to come together to start the journey on the memorial and, uh, and the journey that, that you've been on as a committee? A local uh, man in uh, Bingra, Lynn Payne, who was long committed to getting the story out and having some sort of acknowledgement. A small group of people that were going out to the to the site of uh, the massacre, um, probably for you know it's about fifteen years or so, and one of those was Auntie Sue Blacklock, um, who is also a Munro and uh, a first cousin to Uncle Lyle Munro, uh, who sadly died in the last uh, few days. But th they were having these gatherings, but um, there was a Uniting Church conference, a national conference. There were a number of local people that came along and joined the gathering. They'd long known about it, but it was that secret, the silence, that uh, no one was prepared to acknowledge. And, and then when this gathering was organised, that was uh, the catalyst, if you like, for people to acknowledge the history of that place. So the memorial, after quite a deal of work by that group, particularly through uh, John Brown, Uncle Lyle and Auntie Sue Blacklock, uh, the memorial was constructed and uh, opened in year 2000. And so from then on, there's been, been gatherings every 12 months. Kelvin, just because we can't see you doesn't mean you're, uh, you're not listening to us, mate. We'll bring you in here. Oh, um, no, I'm listening. That's mm. good. Uh, that's great to hear from you. Kelvin, just give us a sense of what you observe in people who, who go along on this day to pay their respects, uh, people black and white, can you give us a sense, mate, of what their emotional response being? First of all, um, before we go any further, I'd just to say that uh, I pay my respects to elders past and present and those emerging, and um, say thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today in regards to this podcast. Um, I myself at the moment am on um, Gilroy country on uh, Burry Yarra country as well. When it comes to uh, the people that go out to Myall Creek, well, um, the the, uh, the vernacular that we use is that they're pilgrims, and that what they do is they come out there and pay respect with regards to the people that passed away all those many years ago. But they also go there for a, a varied reasons of their own. Um, I'm always of the opinion that. No one makes the decision to go out to Moyle Creek to the memorial 
and to pay respect. They were actually drawn there by the spirit of those people that passed away all those years ago. And they may think that they're there of their own accord, but it's the spirits that are calling to them. Um, on days of gatherings, uh, you, can, you know, hundreds of people turn up, uh, men, women and children, uh, various ages. Um, some of them are there because of the one that they want to know the history, the shared history of Australia in regards to this particular massacre. But I also um, want to familiarise myself with massacres in general. Some people come along and um, they, they feel a bit sad and they, some of them feel a bit angry and say, you know, like this is an injustice that a lot of people would like to see left in the past, but because of the story of Mile Creek and the way that it was handled in the judicial system, it has been um, sort of like landmarked as uh, something that should be told to everyone in the world, not just here locally, uh, around um, Gilmore or Wurriaray country, but also wider throughout the state, throughout the nation, and of course across the world. There are some people that cry and, and shed a tear. Those are on days of gatherings. But um, as a local person that lives nearby to um, the massacre site, I live in the town of Inverell, the smaller groups are the ones that I think is a bit more intensified. I've had people that near on burst into tears the moment they get there and saying, I can feel it. I can feel the spirits of the people around me. I and other people say, I can feel electricity in the air. Or someone else says, I've just had uh, that eerie feeling of a cold spell across my body as if someone just walked across my grave. And so what we've got here is a whole gamut of emotions with regards to people when they go out there. But there is one thing that they have all in common and that's what I mentioned earlier on in my little dialogue there, which is that they all seem to think that they came of their own accord. A year and a half ago, I was out there doing some cleaning up around the memorial site, and a chap came walking down the um, memorial walkway towards the memorial itself. And I stopped what I was doing, and he came over and he said, G'day, and I said, how are you? And he says, I've been driving up and down this stretch of road here, between Delangra and Bingra, he said, for about 30 years. This is the first time I've ever come in here. He says, I've always seen the sign out the front, Mile Creek Memorial, the massacre site. He says, I've come past here that many times and it's today I felt compelled to come in. And that's when I said to him, I said, you were called by the spirits. And he says, well, something called to me, he said, because to ignore something for 30 years and then all of a sudden just like that i didn't go past the memorial i went in and now i'm here standing in front of it so what can you tell me about it and i gave him the entire background about you know how they went there for safety the weary array people how they were then um massacred but also the the betrayal by kilmeister who was one of the chaps that was in the huts that was supposed to be helping them out, but in turn turned around and then betrayed them and became one of the per uh, perpetrators instead of being one of their saviors and so forth. And then the judicial process of uh, the first court trial and the second court trial. Now, as I was talking to this chap that had been driving past for 30 years and all of a sudden had driven in, he said, I feel such an incredible amount of sadness. I feel such an incredible amount of shame he says, and an incredible amount of, he says, um, numbness in my being at the moment. He says, I didn't realise it was such an incredible and integral story in regards to um, the history of Australia. And I said, well, it's our shared history, which is part of our motto in regards to Mile Creek Memorial Committee, which we say it's our shared history. It's, it's a history between Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people in regards to this particular instance, but also other instances as well. And so this chap, by the time I'd finished talking to him, he had tears running down his face. And then um, he shook my hands and I said, you know, you be careful, you be safe. And I said, in the words of our um, artist uh, on record here, Colin Isaacs, he says, whenever anyone visits, just tell them, please come back. So I say to you, You've just been told the story. Please come back. If you sit and listen now, if you sit in peace here, 
You can feel their pain. I feel their pain now. Just sitting here talking about it. Feel the fear. I know there was a lot of massacres, but to me, this stands out. This was the only one that people spoke out and they named the perpetrators. They'd already been through the process of the first trial and they said, oh, you know, how does, how does the jury find in this regard? And the jury four person got up and said, we find that the, um, the defendant's not guilty. And they were all clapping themselves on their back. And they said, oh, this is absolutely right. We've got away with it. We've got away with it. And that's when the magistrate at that time turned to um, Don Plunkett, the Attorney General, and said, how do you wish to proceed? And Plunkett said, well, I'm going to uh, retrial. He says, uh, this time I will not go in for the entire massacre in regards to the murder of these people. He says, I'm going to go for the trial of the massacre of a child. So in the first trial, they were, they were, being, they were defending themselves against the massacre of 48 people. But in the second trial, they were being tried for the death of one individual alone, a child name unknown. At the end of that trial, and it was a bit of shenanigans going on with regards to Dangar, the overall squatter and property owner of Mile Creek Station at that time, and he's working behind the scenes trying to get things done. So even at that last and late stage, shenanigans was taken on that these people were going to get away with this, the atrocity that they committed. Now that gentleman that stood up that was a member of that jury after the uh, after the court proceedings were over, he was vilified. People were going on the right and center and saying, how dare you, a white man, stand up against other white people in regards to this atrocity and, and get them committed for um, murder and massacre and all sorts of things. You know, you're a white man, you should be looking after white people. But he said, no, we're here as, as jury people and we must have justice seen to be done, not only done, but seen to be done. His emotions about Mile Creek and the massacre and, and everything that's been involved with it has been going on for 181 years this weekend. It doesn't matter how long the timeline. People are going to be affected by what happened out there at that site. Some people are going to feel very sad. Some people are going to feel very angry. And other people are going to feel all, all sorts of other emotions. But there's one thing that you can say about Mile Creek. It's why the committee has been formed, it's why we're here, that's why we're there as caretakers, it's why we're there as people looking after the interests of the, the, of the 28 people from 181 years ago, which is we will not let them be forgotten. Beningay, Margay, Nanga, which means we remember them. The members of the committee are here to make sure that these people are memorialised, commemorated, and their life's journey has not been forgotten. To the, to the rest of the group, and maybe Janelle, to you, I mean, I think there's a really important message here, and that is, you know, white Australia um, is either ill-informed, uneducated, uh, or uncomfortable with some of these topics and this content. W what's the message? How do we speak to white Australia to, to bring them closer and to try and get a closer reconciliation because you know this is confronting but this is our history that we absolutely need to acknowledge two words truth telling um basically um our history has been portrayed as australia was settled and um the aboriginal people basically were hunters and gatherers it was not recognized under terra nullius which is basically um because it didn't conform to European ideas of farming practices. The, the reason we don't know now is because we, we don't know our real history. And until we do go back and actually look at the reasons and the impact of colonisation and start telling the truth about what happened in, in our history, then people's education and is, is not um, going to be enhanced. I run a lot of cultural competency courses the most common comment I get at the end of any of my courses is, 
I didn't know that. I, I run it in my local community and grew up with these people and they didn't know that history about my Aboriginal journey in the town. Although we've always been Aboriginal, they've always known us as Aboriginal. So I think it comes back to, we need to uh, learn to communicate better. We need to um, have didactic information rather than just the glowing historical view that we have. And we need to acknowledge that these traversities happen all over this country and that they need to be acknowledged so that people can move forward together with, um, with our journey in Australia. Beautifully put, Janelle. Uh, Graham, what have you learned along the way from obviously an initial interest in the, in the topic and in this uh, massacre in particular, but what, what has this taught you, this whole process? I, I think what I've learned uh, came out of the year 2000 when the late Uncle Lyle Munro and uh, Auntie Sue Blacklock uh, spontaneously, they didn't know this was going to happen. Some descendants of those who had murdered their people showed up uh, in great trepidation. They didn't know how they would be received. And um, Uncle Lyle Munro and um, Honey Sue Blacklock, uh, in front of the gathering, they embraced them. Uh, that was a, a, a welcome, a forgiving, loving embrace, welcome to country. In 1989, I found that one of the seven who were hung was my great, great, great uncle. And I also was told that there was a committee to form this memorial at Mile Creek. I went and I joined that committee. I was terrified as I was driving in, absolutely terrified. I really didn't know what people would think of me. I just wanted to say sorry uh, and acknowledge that this had happened. Gumleroy people who are part of this group warmly welcome relatives of those who were involved in the massacre. When I came in, I was introduced to Sue Blacklock. I just stood and looked for a while at him and then I could see the fear. I walked up and I shook her hand and thank her for coming. I said, I'll forgive you. Sue and I, of course, that was our reconciliation. I saw in that embrace that that applies to all of us because when we shed the blood of Aboriginal people and the blood went into the ground, uh, we could never belong here. The only people who could welcome us are the Aboriginal people. And in that embrace, I saw a second chance, um, reconnecting us to Aboriginal people and through their forgiveness to the land itself. So reconciliation for me is, as a non-Indigenous person, it's I'm going there for me first. I need that embrace and only Aboriginal people can give it. Um, and without that embrace, we remain restless wanderers and we just live on the surface of the land but not in true relationship to it. So, and I, yes, yeah, so I think I learned that. Maybe just one other thing is the man Anderson, the convict, uh, Kelvin mentioned Kilmeister who joined the gang. The other convict was Anderson and he refused to join them. And I saw in that choice, I can be either Kilmeister or Anderson today. If I deny this story, I'm as much part of the perpetrators as those who carried out the massacres in 1838. My silence links me to that. But Anderson, and this is the truly inspiring thing of Mile Creek, there were white people who did the right thing. Uh, it, and so in Anderson, I see the 
the choice we need to make today. And so Mile Creek's very confronting, but there's such love at the Mile Creek now. It's, it's a place of love. And you're asking, how can we engage the history? I think Mile Creek is the place to do it because you go there, it's all full history, and you're overwhelmed by the positivity and the love that flows, flows out to you. Beautifully put. And Simon, in some hope there that I know your kids' school, for example, has made it a real cornerstone of some of their activities to, to, to go down each year. Tell us a little bit about that, that experience. Yes, uh, Somerset College, where my son uh, finished year 12 last year, has been traveling down for the commemoration day for some years now. And I think, and Kelvin and Janelle and Graham and Ivan and Peter, can speak to this as well, that the greatest hope we have is with the education of our kids because our kids are wide open. They don't necessarily have set ideas about black and white Australia like say our generation or our parents' generation do. And when these kids go there, Kelvin talked about feeling the spirit of the place and the spirit of country, uh, they all come away from this particular trip, the trip to the Mile Creek Massacre site and say that it's the best thing that they have ever done in their entire school life. And I think that in our kids, these kids of ours can teach us a lot uh, about reconciliation in this country uh, because they understand the importance of it. Uh, they have the empathy and the compassion towards, uh, the, towards the local people, towards, towards First Nations people that maybe uh, some of our generation and previous generations have lacked over the years. So yeah, it's definitely, John O has had a profound effect on a lot of students and they carry that message back home and into their communities as well. Simon, uh, yeah, I, I can uh, really resonate with what you are saying there about the importance of the involvement of children. Because of my childhood, I, I grew up in Victoria on a dairy farm and Yorta Yorta country. And it was as though there were, there were two communities uh, sharing the same space, but never connecting. Uh, and and as, a, as a, uh, a young person, I, I can remember feeling very uncomfortable about that, but not knowing how um, to change that. And I think the, the genius of Mile Creek is that the uh, right from the outset, uh, when the committee was formed, we insisted that there be 50% of the committee be Aboriginal, 50% non-Indigenous. And I think the problem has been, certainly in my generation, um, that childhood, that, that those two worlds shared the same space but never connected. Once we had the conversation around the truth of the history of this nation, that's when the relationships began to form uh, and, and we could find our way forward. And, and certainly, I mean, um, I, I think there's over a dozen schools uh, represented each, each year, you know, as communities, not just one or two students from a school, but school communities come along and it gives me great hope they are going to have the conversations that my generation didn't have with our aboriginal brothers and sisters but peter would you like to to chime in here and and give us some insights into you know what writing this book and what diving into the history of not just this massacre but other massacres as well uh has has done to you well, I first, I should explain, I first came across the story of the Mile Creek Massacre in 1978, when I was, um, I was actually a first year out um, history teacher and I was doing some research in the library. And I came across the story and as soon as I saw, read the story, I was in a, a book called Early Colonial Scandals by Bill Wannon. It was about a 14 page account of it. The thing that affected me initially was just the horror of the massacre. But also then the, um, I was shocked and horrified that here I was, a, an educated person, 
I was only 23 at the time, but um, you know, I'd, um, you know, had a university education, and I knew nothing about this side of Australia's history. And I suppose that's one of the the biggest things that you know, because I've lived with the story since then, and I've spent you know many many um, countless hours researching more and more detail about it and about all the surrounding history. Um, because it is so familiar to me, um, I'm always amazed when I find people still, like nearly 40 years later, or 40 years, 42 years later, that are still ignorant about it. The younger generation are getting some of it in, in schools now. It's still not as... Um, strongly in the syllabus as it should be. You know, it's there, but in, in some of the um, syllabus, it's an option, you know, rather, so the teacher doesn't have to do it if they don't want to. So, you know, it, it should be there, and, uh, you know, it should be really part of the Australian consciousness. What we wanted to do as a, a group of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people working together, was to tell the truth of our shared history. When I was going to school, we heard nothing of the Aboriginals. The history wasn't told. We should have known about all these stories of Australia. We had so many stories, so many lies. It was the Aboriginals' fault and not... That's why they was killed, because they was leaving destruction everywhere. But it wasn't so. That's how it was portrayed, that Australia didn't have any horrible history. But we had one of the worst, and it was hidden for generations and generations. You know, when Liz, Lynn Payne was um, trying to put together a group of people to go out to um, the massacre site well before there was a memorial out there, he wanted to create a small memorial using aspects of uh, uh, gates that came from the um, the stockyards and uh, the people in his own community of Warri Elder and surrounding areas, they resisted it and said, no, we don't want that out there. We don't want people to be thinking about massacres and white people killing black people and things like that. We just don't want any of it at all. So there was resistance there. Um, by and large, over the years, there are people who have heard about Mile Creek and have thought, what an incredibly strong and verdant story and uh, I want to know more. And yet there are others that also read the story and say, well, look, it happened in the past. Why don't we leave it in the past and just forget about it? And then we also have people that go out to the memorial site. And it hasn't happened uh, in the last few years, but it has happened prior to that, where people have gone out to the memorial site and they've vandalised certain aspects of it. And the word um, on the plaque down at the memorial, uh, there's the word murdered as part of the plaque and someone's come along with a chisel and has tried to, to obliterate the word murdered off the plaque. It's not just a matter of um, we're doing it because we want to make people feel guilty or we want to stir up animosity within our communities or anything else like that. We should not and cannot forget what happened in the past. If we turn around and allow members of our community who have no regard for Mile Creek and what happened there, or for Rappin, or Waterloo Creek, or for any other place throughout our nation where slaughters have occurred, then such a thing will be doomed to be repeated. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think a lot of this is, um, you know, our history and how it's been presented to us. People don't have the knowledge about the history when when they learn the knowledge, um, I find it very beneficial to find what I call points of connectedness, um, where we can connect that history to their uh, to their history, and it helps them identify what it is we're actually talking about. Education is one thing, communication is one thing, and truth-telling is one thing, but you need a combination of all those, and you need to give people points that they can connect to, that they understand. A lot of people say it should have been left in the past. If we connect it to, to people's everyday life, then, then their understanding grows, 
And the other thing we have to do is encourage people to um, seek their own knowledge and, and to seek what is the, the truth rather than just be spoon fed what's given to them. I had a young um, medical student who was um, talking to me um, in one of the lectures and we were talking about connection to country. A couple of weeks later, he came back to me and he said, I think I know what, you, what Aboriginal people mean about connection to country now. And I was very curious and he'd grown up on a farm. His parents had decided to sell it when he was at university and didn't seek his permission and sold it. So what he related to was he'd been, he knew that country all over. It was where he grew up. He had lots of family memories there um, and he couldn't go back there anymore. And he had no choice about mm. that fact. So it connected with him how Aboriginal people feel about they're connected to country is if you can't have it anymore and the choice is taken away from you and it's something that's very dear to your heart, then it impacts on you. So I think while we, we can say we need to tell people, we also need to give them opportunities to connect that to their own um, living experience. And that way that can help them evolve that uh, knowledge and, and move forward. Janelle, that's a great example. I have plenty more of those. Yeah. <laughs> really good one, really good. Well, and we could probably listen to Janelle and Kelvin and, and others for a long time to come. We are kind of getting near the end of our uh, our time, I, I guess, to the group. And I don't know if there's one spokesperson and maybe there shouldn't be. What's the message out of today to white Australia, young Australia, people of all backgrounds? What do we need to learn from Mile Creek, not just the history for the future that, that you guys and your committee are trying to forge? What, what's, what's the takeaway you'd like people maybe to walk away from this today and into the future? And I have a, a go, um, Jonathan. That we have a saying in Sydney, Friends of Mile Creek, the path to the future passes through the past and there's no other way. And it's the path to our greatness as a nation and to charting our place in the world with compassion and integrity and that for me is a summary of what we've been talking about i'm not sure we could get any better words than that simon to you the last chance so this has been a wonderful and important reflection this has been just uh, truly astounding today Yes, it certainly has. And it comes at a time, Jono, when with what's happening in America, there are very painful lessons for Americans as well, who uh, in many cases, uh, white America denies the history of slavery over there. Uh, it caused a civil war and the death of more than 600,000 people 150 odd years ago. And Australia is still just getting to grips, I think, uh, with this sort of reckoning and with this reconciliation. I think the great thing about Mile Creek and the great thing about the memorial is that, that it is a touch point and we need these touch points. Uh, Janelle and Kelvin have put it beautifully that you need a place where we can gather and we can pay our respects to those that have been uh, mercilessly killed and, and wasted along the way but not to make those same mistakes that have been made in the past. And that uh, I think through our kids in particular, that we can find them uh, as, as leading the way forward for all of us. Here, here. Well, unfortunately we are out of time. Janelle Speed, Ivan Roberts, Peter Stewart, Kelvin Brown, Graham Cordner, the friends of Mile Creek. You've got two more friends in us. And boy, I hope this message gets out and resonates because it's important and it is absolutely part of our past, we must acknowledge, and, and our future depends on it. So to one and all, uh, we thank you and, and we're really appreciative of your time today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Simon. Simon. Oh, thanks, everyone. Simon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All thanks, the best, Kelvin. be safe. And you, Kelvin. <laughs> 
The Mile Creek Massacre and its story makes you very angry, but it also makes you understand that the fact that Aboriginal people have come through that and still have the capacity for forgiveness, the capacity for that story to bring communities together is very powerful, which is why um, that story means so much to the Australian narrative and particularly to young people to understand that this is our truth.